College basketball is down to its final game of the season, and it will be a true clash of the Titans as a pair of number one seeds in UConn and Purdue square off in Phoenix. Locked On Podcast Network presents the 2024 NCAA Bracket Breakdown. Presented by Nissan. What's up, folks? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts here on this live edition, Locked On College Basketball. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade. You are joining us at the place to get college basketball content every single day. And folks, we are down to the final two. I want to thank all of you who have made the show your first listen or your first watch throughout the season, throughout the off season, into the regular season, into the NCAA tournament, and now here as we get ready to wrap up what has been a fantastic, fun 2023-24 college basketball season. I want to shout out all the everyday listeners. Also remind you folks, you can listen to this show ad-free on Amazon Music if you have not done so yet. Great place to come check out the Locked On College Basketball Show. Isaac, Purdue, UConn. This is the finale. This is the matchup that so many people were anticipating, expecting, hoping, whatever it may be. The two number one seeds, a clash of the Titans, two seven-footers, two seven-foot-two folks. In fact, we just saw this stat that this is the first national championship matchup where the two starting centers are seven-foot-two or taller. There is so, so much to love about this matchup. We're going to kind of close the show getting into some of the storylines and specifics of the actual matchup between these two teams, but we want to start talking about these final four matchups. And Isaac, we'll actually start with the second game of the day on Saturday, this matchup between Alabama and UConn, because for most of this game, it, and Alabama was was rarely in the lead, but they were never out of it. They were kind of in this game all the way throughout. Really nice shooting performance in the first half, kind of withered away in the second half, but still a big shout out to Nate Oates' team uh, for being a team that, that not only got to the Final Four, but gave UConn more trouble than anybody else has in this NCAA tournament. <laughs> they did, Andy. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're going to shower all sorts of praise on UConn, so let's make sure that we do the same to Alabama for, as we've talked about, this great run, Andy. We, we've we mentioned how last year was the year. Number one overall seed, they got the best freshman in America, and they just wilted. Couldn't do it. Was it play? Was it everything off the court that was surrounding it? We don't know, but kudos, because let's mm -hmm. also remember, Nate Oates lost all three of his assistant coaches to head yeah. coaching gigs this year. And so to bring in this collection of dudes to get a whole new coaching staff and wind up being one of the final four teams and giving UConn everything they just did. Andy, like you said, this 14 point margin that we see in the, as the final margin of victory is not a good representation of how tight this game truly was, which I think says all the more about just how good and veteran and experienced and calculated UConn is that they were just able to continue pushing this thing out and salting it away to keep their streak alive of having won every NCAA tournament game last season and this season by 13 or more points. Yeah, it was uh, one of the big things we talked about coming into this game was, was what Alabama was going to need to do offensively. And the, the big talking point was the outside shooting because this, this is a team that lives and dies on the three-point shooting they have all throughout the entire season. And coming into a matchup where, I mean, we've seen what Donovan Klingon has done to other high-level offenses just by his, his pure presence alone. I mean, he was an incredible neutralizer against Illinois earlier uh, in this tournament. And, and we kind of thought, okay, the combination of, you know, potentially not having right sell at full strength, he did play and he scored six points, but between not having him as one of their best drivers, you're going against the team with Klingon in the paint and you kind of rely on the three point shot. We thought, okay, this is a team that's going to need to make a whole bunch of threes and they're going to need to take a whole bunch of them. We speculated 20 was potentially the number of makes that, that this Alabama team was going to need to have in order to win this game. And in the first half, they go eight of 11 and they're down four in theory, meaning if they had made 10 threes, they would have been up at halftime. So it was kind of trending towards, hey, this is a team that probably does need to knock down, maybe not exactly 20, but 16, 17, 18 at minimum. And after going eight of 11 in the first half, which is, I mean, incredible to shoot that in the half against anybody in college basketball to do that against UConn is crazy. But then in the second half, they just didn't have it. 
three of 12. I don't think they attempted enough threes. Part of that was some turnover stuff. Part of it was just not just not being able to get the get the looks off that they wanted to get, but to only knock down three in the second half. I mean, like you like you said, they kept it close throughout, but uh, not being able to get those looks and get and, and knock down those shots really kind of crushed this team in the second half. Andy, the star of the game is the freshman Steph yeah. Castle, and what was neat about it is is we had uh, predicted this earlier in the week and said, look, we wouldn't be surprised at all if Danny Hurley goes out and says, you know what, Steph. Your job tonight is to hold down Mark Sears. And they did for a while. And he did, in fact, have Steph Castle and his 6'6 frame on 6'1 Mark Sears. And I think it took, um, I, I, I just think it took him a while to get unhinged. He didn't have any shot attempts for a good long while, Andy. Now, once Sears did get going, he had a perfect five of five in the first half. Had a really nice second half. So, you know, gets unglued as he often has in this tournament in the second half. But Castle was a true two-way player in this game, Andy. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, right out of the gate, we saw Alabama doing what they've done to multiple non-shooters in this tournament, kind of backing off. You saw Grant Nelson right out of the gate, um, just not even attempting to close out on Steph Castle. Castle made him pay with two threes early and uh, great stuff there. Uh, from Castle, but then he just kept going. But I loved, I loved what Hurley did, Andy. He figured out a way to say, "All right, look, if you're going to sag off Castle and he's not going to hit him, he started using him as using him as the screener, having him roll, got in some action, utilized him as a backdoor cutter, just found other ways for his stud freshman to get involved." And I loved it too because we know, as we've always talked about, Danny Hurley will find any excuse <laughs> to find a slight. And I was watching the post game interview with Tracy Wolfson, who hilariously got up on a ladder after they had. <laughs> did you catch that, Andy? Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, for those who didn't see it, when Tracy Wolfson, who I she's very short, I can look it up later, but interviewing Zach Eady after the first game was like this, and uh, the the rest of the broadcast crew joked with her that she should get a ladder. Well, sure enough, she did to interview <laughs> Donovan Klingon. So props to Tracy Wolfson for that. But um, you could hear it in Danny Hurley's voice in his response talking about Steph Castle that he's like, well, they chose to sag off him and uh, he made him pay. And so like always, always finding the slight hilarious stuff there, but great, great game for Steph Castle. I know he got to that fourth foul um, and had to go out early, but he had already done all the heavy lifting great night and was part of another balanced offensive approach from the Huskies, Andy. And I thought this is the right strategy for Nate Oates in Alabama. Like I, I, this, if I was going to get beat by somebody on UConn, I would have wanted to get beat by Steph Castle because he has not been a huge offensive contributor for UConn. He is a great player. He is a great defensive player. And I think he has more offensive talent than he has been able to show at UConn in part because of the talent around him in part because he is a very unselfish player and is not out there trying to go get his, but he's a, he's a, a clear cut one and done talent. He is, there's never been any point in this season where it was expected that he was going to return to school. And a lot of guys like that try to get their shots, their looks, and he's never been that type of player. And so for to go into this game and have Alabama make it plainly clear to him and to the entire team and to everybody in the arena and the millions of people watching, we don't think you can beat us offensively. I mean, that was the direct message that Nate Oates in Alabama sent to Stefan Castle, a true freshman who has not stepped into that role throughout the season, and for him to then step up and do it. I mean, that is that is incredible. He knocked down his first two threes. He finished two of six, so you know the law of averages caught up to him a little bit. But <laughs> 21 points was a season high for him. It tied his season high. So to have arguably his best offensive game in the most important game of the entire season – when everybody knew that the opposing team wasn't taking him seriously as an offensive threat. I mean, that shows so much about Danny Hurley's coaching, about this team's overall depth, that they can have somebody come out and beat you who who hasn't really taken on that role. And you alluded to it perfectly with how they shifted his role to get him to be into that that short role situation and, and backdoor cutting and kind of doing things that made Alabama's strategy not work as well. Fantastic coaching from Hurley, and his guys stepped up when they needed to. And, and Andy, I love that you just pointed out that depth. I'm actually bringing up, for those watching live on YouTube, a, a comment from Mr. Nobody who said, UConn is like a heavyweight boxer that just wears you down with body shots. Yeah. I've also, that, that's a great comment, Mr. Nobody. Um, I also like it, liken it to 
a ground attack in football where it's just like those those just bruising mm-hmm. running backs who eventually just, you know, like Jerome Bettis, the bus, man. Eventually you're just like, I'm so tired of tackling you, you know. Um, and, and so that's a great point from Mr. Nobody there. And I just love that they just keep coming, keep coming. And as soon as, you know, next thing you know, it's out to this double-digit lead. And, um, man, it was crazy stuff, Andy. And, and I want to go to the second half, if I could, really quick, where it was a half of runs. We had um, Alabama going on a 7-0 run. UConn responded with their own 7-0 run. Then UConn goes on a 9-1 run to tie it up. And from there, or excuse me, Bama went on a 9-1 run to tie it up. And from there, UConn goes on an 8-0 run. And that was just kind of it. And, um, and and they just do it methodically. Like everyone got so hyped for that Grant Nelson. It wasn't really a dunk. It kind of threw it down, you know, yeah. threw it in. But Klingon's like, all right, fine. I'm just going to keep working. And then Klingon had those stretches where he was like just – erasing Mark Sears off the glass, had a Duncan transition, erase Nelson off the glass, had another, and it was just like, sure, fine, get all hyped, but we're just going to keep coming at you. And Andy, so impressive what they were able to do, shutting down this high-octane offense, zero fast break points, Andy, for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Incredible stuff. Really, really good stuff. Balanced offensive attack, defensive attack from UConn. Uh, this team has been rolling for, I mean, really for two years now. And and uh, Alabama, great fight from them, but not surprised they weren't able to slow down the UConn train. All right. Well, Andy, Purdue's quest to pull a Virginia remains intact after they took down NC State, who unfortunately finally ran out of gas behind another pedestrian as grant hill called it zach Eady performance we got more and we'll try to figure that out coming up in just a second right after i tell you about nissan are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further do you ever wonder what adventure could be waiting around the next corner well our friends at nissan have a lineup of suvs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive built-in Google is always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of having to connect your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Or how about the 2024 Pathfinder? It's got room for up to eight, exactly what my family would want to be getting if we were buying one of these, an expansive cargo capacity and advanced available 4x4 capability. With over with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. So take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Andy, let's rewind the clock back to the first game of the night where Purdue won 63-50. to We had kind of dubbed this game the the feel-good story game because you either were going to have NC State's miracle run continuing on for a 10th straight game, or we were going to see the the continued pursuit of redemption for Purdue. Unfortunately for NC State, man, it just, they had won teams against great games, but they had not played one of the two best teams in the nation. And that's what happened, Andy, on Saturday night, Saturday night, giving the Boilermakers their second ever championship appearance. The other one coming in 1969. We'll get into talking about later on, like, can they finally end the Big Ten streak dating back to 2000? We'll see. But Andy, where I want to start is by asking you and, and I, and I guess everyone in the chat as well, because we got a lot of great chat action going on this question. Have we gotten perhaps numb or desensitized to Zach Eady's exploits? And here's why I ask this. Zach Eady tonight finished with the following stat line. You ready for this? Zach Eady, here we go. 20 points, 12 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 blocks. And Andy, in the broadcast, as I joked a second ago, Grant Hill called it pedestrian. Uh, I saw several people on Twitter saying like... uh, Somebody literally said, if I was 7-4, I'd be dominating this game more than this. And and it's just like, 
if this is just a so so subpar performance and he's becoming the first player ever to have six straight NCAA tournament games of 20 points, 10 rebounds, then then I don't know what we're doing. What do you think about this, Andy? First of all, I just don't who cares what people say on Twitter. Like we just <laughs> we cannot like people have been saying that about Zach Eady for years. Like literally people and, and and obviously this is not true. There have been other seven and a half foot players in college basketball. There are other seven foot plus guys in college basketball right now. If every seven foot three, seven foot four player was capable of doing what Zach Eady's doing, they would be doing it. But they're not. Like they're not produced had how many seven and a half foot players in the last like 15, 20 years? And they're not, they're not doing this. Like Zach Eady is clearly more skilled and more talented than many of those other players. That is why he's in double, a back-to-back national player of the year. It is not just because of his size. Obviously, it is a part of his story. Well, no. It's silly to pretend it's not, but it is not the driving factor for all of that success for him. He had five turnovers in this game. In a lot of ways, there it was a question. It, it wasn't his best performance. Nine of fourteen from the field, twenty points and twelve rebounds is still really dang good. And I think the fact that it felt like a pedestrian performance says less says more about the fact that Zach he typically puts up performances better than this. Like this is below average for him. He only barely got to twenty and ten, which, like you said, he has done six games in a row. He has now become the third player ever in the same NCAA tournament to have one hundred and forty or more points and 70 or more rebounds. The only other players to ever do that are Hall of Famers Elvin Hayes and Jerry West. This is an an extraordinary run for Zach Eady. And I think, yes, there are just going to be trolls and people saying things on the internet that make no sense. Like, oh, if I was that tall, I could do it. But I think part of where this comes from is the amount of media narrative kind of pushing how great Zach Eady is. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be doing that. Right. They should, and they are for good reason, because what he is doing is unbelievable, and it's an all-time NCAA tournament performance, and I think that that should be highlighted. But I do think there is some fatigue by the, the general audience, whether it's people who lost to, to, to Purdue earlier in the season and are tired of seeing him. Like, great players get hated for being great, and, and they get hated for how often they're on their screen and how often broadcasters are talking about them and how often people are tweeting about them. That creates people having extra frustration about the player. That is what's happening with Zach Eady because he is so tall and because some people who, who don't know ball think, oh, if I was that tall, I could do it too. But it's it's just the way that people are, are getting frustrated at an all-time icon who is getting a lot of much, much deserved publicity for how great of a tournament he's having. Andy, did you like NC State's decision for the most part of the game to guard him straight up, to guard Zach Eady straight up instead of doubling? Yeah, I mean... Yes and no. I mean, I think, again, the turnovers, a lot of the turnovers were on those kind of delayed doubles where they'd send somebody after he put the ball Mm -hmm. on the deck. I also Mm -hmm. think Edie was just playing a little sloppier than he then typical. Like he just, he wasn't quite as sharp as normal. And I think that that it happens. And again, we, as we said, he still had a good game, but uh, I, NC State kind of had to try something. We've seen the amount of doubles not working. And I think what really contributed to NC State keeping this game a little bit closer was the fact that Braden Smith just did not have yeah. the game. I mean, he was he was a non-factor offensively. I think if you had told Kevin Keats that Braden Smith wasn't going to make a three-pointer in this game, or at least he was sorry, he's only going to make one, and he was going to go one of nine. And it was right at the end, yeah. But if you told Kevin Keats that, like, hey, for the first 38 minutes of this game, Braden Smith's not going to make a three, I think Kevin Keats would have doubled and tripled Zach Eady and said, okay, fine. We're going to throw everything at Edie because the guards aren't playing well. But he took a calculated risk saying, hey, let's play Edie straight up and let's try to slow down the guards. And again, maybe that was part of what contributed to Braden Smith not having a very good offensive game. So I, there's a lot of kind of factors to it. I, I I thought that Kevin Keats coached as a decent game. I thought they had an okay strategy coming into this one. But, you know, as, as much as we can lament what they did or didn't do defensively, they scored 50 points. And that's just not enough. It's not enough to be a team like Purdue. They ran out of gas in the second half. So that the issues for, for NC State's team was, was on the offensive end of the floor. And to Smith's credit, even on a day where he was shooting poorly, still had eight rebounds, yeah. six assists. And you know, we, we talked, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we've talked a lot this year about his ability to have triple double type numbers just about game in and game out. And he did in those other two statistical categories. It's just like somebody in baseball not letting a, uh, a slump at the plate mm-hmm. affect their defense, right? Now, similar to Zach Eady, Smith also had five of their 16 turnovers. So you don't love that from your point guard, but you'll take the other stuff. 
And, and Andy, what I thought was important is that, you know, we've talked about what an X factor Lance Jones has been for this team. This is the real difference maker when everyone, you know, I, I think I tweeted something to the effect of, Hey, like I told you at the beginning of this tournament, don't let your friends talk you into <laughs> Purdue's just Purdue. And they're the same thing. And it's going to happen all over again. Like get all the free money you can on Purdue mm -hmm. because they're going to be a great value. And it's proven to be true because it's not the same team. And a big part of that is Lance Jones, who in this game was five of 12 from the field, four of nine from three, 14 points, four rebounds. He did have that one ill-advised three in transition <laughs> with nobody under to rebound. But outside of that, I thought played a great game. Fletcher Lawyer had three threes, Andy. And so just even in a game where Smith wasn't doing it as much, it was nice to get that from those other guys alongside him. Yeah, yeah. Lance Jones is a, a monstrous addition for this team. I, I mean, you can just tell what he brings to this this lineup that they didn't have last year, that athleticism, that juice, uh, the a, additional three-point shooting. Obviously, that's been a huge factor for him to knock down four of the ten made threes that Purdue had in this game. I mean, he was a really big factor. I really like what Trey Kaufman-Wren brings to this team as yes. well. Yeah. He only had seven points, but and I, I don't know if this happened in other games. Um, I remember it very distinctly in the Gonzaga game where in the second half, Purdue went to Kaufman Red right away, and I think he had six or eight points in the first like three minutes of the second half against Gonzaga, and he kind of did that in this game as well against NC State. Like, kind of went to him really early. I don't know if it's to give Edie a prolonged break or if it's like a, a situation where they know the defense is keyed in on Edie coming out of the half, and they kind of throw something different at them by going at Kaufman Red. But it really worked. I mean, he only had seven points in this game, and I think most of them came in that stretch. But it was really valuable minutes, and, and I noticed this too, like. We've talked about this a handful of times on the show that that bench depth is obviously valuable, but a lot of the great teams don't play their bench all that often. Uh -huh. Both UConn and Purdue only had six players score in their respective wins. Uh, I, all five starters for Purdue, as well as Mason Gillis, who had eight points, and then Samson Johnson had seven points for UConn off the bench. So, uh, going to be interesting. We'll get into more of what that means for the the matchup coming up on uh, on Monday. But uh, interesting to see that these two teams kind of relied pretty heavily on that starting lineup, and for Purdue to do it without Braden Smith offering much. Uh, in terms of scoring offensively is a testament to their overall depth outside of just Edie. But obviously, of course, you know, Edie, Edie had a big factor as well. Yeah. And Andy, I think one of the things we often hear about is once we get to this part of the season, the commercial breaks are longer, there's more, you know, opportunities to catch mm -hmm. your breath. And so uh, depth is less of a value as it is yeah. in the season. And, and Andy, I know we need to get to another break here, but Briefly, let's just give some flowers, same as we did to Alabama, man, mm -hmm. to NC State for this run. I know it kind of just sputtered and ran out of gas on Saturday night. DJ Burns didn't wasn't able to have the same impact as he has had, as we expected going up against yeah. Zach Eady and giving up seven inches to him. But um, Casey Morsell, who's so often been really good, um, zero points on five, zero, oh, five from the field. Uh, Michael O'Connell, like that was a bummer losing him early, tried to make a go of it and just couldn't, you know, like that, that hammy or whatever it was just didn't allow him much. And, um, it was cool to see Breon pass get in, have a couple buckets for NC state who had made a big three in that Louisville game that kind of ignited yeah. the ACC tournament run. So, um, and of course, great to see the other DJ, the one that maybe not as many people know, but the one that is the leading scorer for NC State, DJ Horn, really show out in this game. I know kind of a struggle shooting for him as well, two of eight from three, but uh, man, what a run from Kevin Keats and his guys. Absolutely. But Isaac... We know that UConn and Purdue, that this was the matchup that everybody was most anticipating, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic, and we're not even going to be able to touch all of the different storylines that are coming into this game. We're going to have a lot more about those uh, on episodes leading up to the national championship, but we are going to try to close out today's show, get into some of those big storylines and what this matchup might look like, and we're going to talk all about that in just a second. <laughs> Before we do that, though, I want to tell you that today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, if you are looking for some last, last minute tickets to the national championship, if your team made it and you're like, man, I got to get out there. Maybe you weren't planning on going and now you want to make it out there. Look, I can't help you with airfare. I can't help you with hotels, but getting into the games, you got to use Game Time because they have you covered. 
Or if you're somebody who's given up on the tournament and moved on, Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. So with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time makes the takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Their last minute deals, you can save up to 60% off buying last minute tickets for sports, comedy, concerts, theater, and more. And look, if you ever have concern about your tickets being bogus, Game Time's ticket coverage uh, and your purchase is covered by them with the most flexible customer service policy in the entire ticketing industry. I love that that gives me that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices. Guaranteed. All right, Isaac, let's wrap this thing up talking about this matchup here, UConn-Purdue. Again, I don't want to say it's what everybody was rooting for because I am sure that there are (laughs) Alabama fans and NC State fans and fans of literally every other team who was not rooting for UConn and Purdue. But I, it's hard to not have wanted this matchup from a – just a pure basketball perspective, the yeah. intrigue, the the lineups, the matchups, uh, not just the storylines, all of it. Obviously, Edie versus Klingon is the big story in terms of the actual like basketball on the court storyline of the, these two seven footers, two defensive stalwarts, two very good low post offensive scorers. That's definitely going to be the biggest matchup on the court. But from a storyline perspective, I mean, when we had Gonzaga Baylor in 2021, that's the last time that we had like the clear cut. These are the two best teams in college basketball and they're playing each other in the national championship. And because the sport has so many teams, because the NCAA tournament is a single elimination tournament over the course of three weeks, it is pretty rare to get the two best teams in college basketball actually facing off against each other. And with apologies to Houston, because I think that they were in that conversation throughout the year, I think it's pretty clear that this year, like we had in 21, is the two best teams in college basketball squaring off for all the marbles? Yep, Andy, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. To to let's let's rem- remember Houston in memoriam here because were it not for injuries, mm-hmm. I think legitimately we've kept that threesome intact. Yeah. But as those injuries mounted, I mean that's just the way it goes. These were the two best, and that's what we get. Not necessarily uh, the what I'm about to say. Well, let me just say it, and then I'll explain mm-hmm. what I'm saying. Since the tournament expanded to 64 back in the 1985 season, this will be the 10th time we've had a one seed versus one seed in the national championship. So that's obviously not saying the two best teams necessarily, but two of the four best teams, 10th time. And and Andy, it's just good for the sport when we get that. Obviously, we're going to get the same thing in the women's game on Sunday afternoon, a one seed versus a one seed as well. And so it's great that both uh, the men's and women's championships are going to get Uh, a one seed. And, you know, it's fun when we get it, but even here, it's a upsets early chalk late situation again. And thankfully it's good for content and it's good for what's going to happen on the court as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, you want, you, you, you want the best teams, but you also just want the most entertaining teams to watch. And I think that's where this matchup is intriguing because I think most people would agree that UConn is one of the most interesting, fun, compelling teams to watch in college basketball. They play a a style where you don't ever, you don't always know which player is going to go off. So you're not, it's not always going to be the same guys dominating like we had in this game where Stefan Castle was their leading scorer. I wouldn't have projected that before the game. Most of the people wouldn't have projected that either. And I think that makes UConn stylistically really fun to watch. Purdue, not as many people find them as fun to watch, and I think that that's fair, and I understand that from a, you know, I get it. They they play a little bit of a slower pace, and then they're very ball dominant down on the block, but the matchup is fun, and I think that's what's most compelling is maybe Purdue's not your favorite team to watch, but Purdue versus UConn will be fun to watch. It's very hard to imagine a scenario where this game isn't very compelling with how Edie and Klingon match up on the block, the matchup out in the guard rooms as well. Braden Smith and and Tristan Newton are two of the best, most versatile uh, 
well-rounded point guards in literally all of college basketball. I'm now even extra intrigued by how Stefan Castle is going to be deployed by Danny <laughs> Gurley's team. Are they going to put him on Lance Jones? Are they going to put him directly on Braden Smith? Yeah. How is that going to match up? On the flip side, Matt Painter is probably not going to sag way off of Stefan Castle. So now I'm curious how they are going to attempt to defend him. There's just a lot. There are two mm. great coaches, two great rosters, two great programs. Like, it's hard to not feel excited about the matchup, even if maybe these aren't your two favorite teams uh, just stylistically in college basketball. Yeah, if only we could bump up that tip time just a little bit, man. I'm already <laughs> sleepy. Andy on the West Coast is all excited about it. Fine, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, Andy, that's a great point because I think um, about the, the defensive assignments because we look at what happened tonight in this game and we think, Oh, well, then, of course, Steph Castle's going to guard Braden Smith. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think we can just assume that. I think it's because it what it's what made most sense against Alabama yeah. and what they have and who they deploy. And it might very well be the case to once again cut off the head of the snake with Braden Smith. Mm -hmm. But then you've got Lawyer and Jones. And, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times this week. But um, just in terms of size and height, UConn's backcourt, man, they've got an advantage there over Purdue that the Boilermakers are going to have to find a way to overcome. And so there's a lot. Obviously, we're going to get into depth on this all a lot more on Monday show. But Andy, a couple quick storylines we could probably look at here. One of the big ones, uh, we often talk about Big Ten's national championship drought. It goes all the way back to 2000 in Michigan State. Can Purdue end it? We're going to find that out on Monday night or Andy perhaps Purdue will pull that in Virginia and we'll just now forever assume that you know what maybe would would you willingly lose to a 16 seed as a one <laughs> if it guaranteed you win the national championship the next year we'll see about that Andy what are some other storylines you're watching for yeah those are the two big ones with Purdue and for UConn it's it's one we've talked about quite a few times can they repeat as national champions something that has not been done since those Billy Donovan led Florida teams in 2006 and 2007 and again UConn not only in the final four not only now in the national championship they became the first defending champion to make it past the sweet 16 since Florida did that in 2006 and 2007. Like it has been a long time since a defending champion has even advanced uh, nearly as far as UConn has. And, and we mentioned this when this game happened, but when UConn played San Diego state uh, in that round of 32 or in the, yeah, in the sweet 16, um, that was the fourth time that the two teams that played in the national championship the year previously had squared off in the, the NCAA tournament the next year. And all four times that that has happened, one of those two teams went on to win the national championship. Three of those four times, it was the defending champion, including Florida, who played UCLA in the 2007 tournament. So... UConn's got a chance to kind of repeat some history here and do what Florida, do what nobody's done since Florida uh, and, and be that team that, that wins the national championship two years in a row and really kind of, that'll be their sixth championship if they do it. I think at this point, the conversations around UConn would really kind of cement their status as one of the true elite programs in all of college basketball, uh, especially, I mean, winning back-to-back -back championships just incredibly rare in the modern era. And, and Danny Hurley's team's got a chance to do it. And they got a chance to do it by winning every single game by 13 plus, if they can do that against Purdue. Do very tall task, obviously, but uh, this has been uh, a two a, a dominant two year stretch by Danny Hurley's team, and we'll see if they can keep it up. Yeah, I mean, we we legitimate. I mean, Andy, this is the territory we're in. If UConn wins this game by thirteen or more points, we're legitimately talking about this as one of the most legendary, iconic back to back year stretches in NCAA history. I mean that that's the territory we're in. But again. If they don't win, if UConn doesn't complete it on Monday night, I, I don't think it is remembered the same way as we talked about um, on, on Friday's show. And as for Purdue, you know, it's like, I, I, I guess they don't get the full redemption if they don't win on Monday night, but I think they've got enough redemption to have cleared up what they did uh, last season. Andy, very quickly, obviously tomorrow, Sunday, is the Women's National Championship game. The it, the chat is blowing up with talking about the the moving screen, the illegal mm. screen call at the end of the game on Friday night. I quickly need your take on it. I'll give mine, and then let's give a women's championship game prediction. Yeah, uh, it was the right call, and it sucks. I mean, it sucks. Like, <laughs> it's just it was a moving screen, and I do believe that officials should officiate the final seconds of games, and really in any sport, differently. Having said that, this was a pretty blatant moving screen. And it, I mean, it's really unfortunate for UConn that it had, that it happened the way that it did. But 
this is the right call. I, I, and I think you have to make that call. If, if it was a little bit more subtle, maybe you don't make that call. But uh, you watch the replays of it, and that elbow flares out in a pretty significant way. So I thought it was the right call. I thought it was a bummer way for the season to end for UConn. I'm going with South Carolina in the championship. Uh, I love, love Caitlin Clark's game, love what they've been able to do to be back here in this position. But Don Staley and the Gamecocks are really, really good, and I think they're going to win this one. Yep. Uh, everything you just said is where I've been at on it. You you, you don't want to have to make that call, but mm-hmm. it, like both the slide and the elbow on their own, I thought, were enough to make it a foul, uh, to, to make it worthy of a call. And so, man, it, it was egregious enough to do that. And then I'm with you. It's so funny how we have all the stars, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and Juju Watkins and on and on and on. But it's this South Carolina team yep. that is like, hey, remember us? We're undefeated, right? <laughs> and so uh, Camilla Cardoso, Don Staley, mm-hmm. I think they get it done and have a national undefeated national championship run. And Caitlin Clark's wonderful career comes to an end as a runner-up back-to-back. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Folks, thank you so much for making the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. We appreciate all of you hanging out with us here on the live as well. We're going to be live again on Monday night, probably later than this. As Isaac alluded to, that game has got a late, late start time, especially for two teams not located on the West Coast. Uh, but it's going to be a fantastic night. Isaac, my friend, I'm already looking forward to getting to do that live show after that game. Thanks again to those of you who've made the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Apologies to the lawyer family, not that they need it anymore. Let's go, Wildcats. And until Monday, or until Monday, peace.